Well, good morning. Um, yeah, I got I, I stood in the back with Melissa, and it was like it was kind of cool to see the whole church worshiping. It was neat. I don't normally see it. I'll just see his Warner and the band. So, um, well, I'm Jonathan. I'm one of the pastors here. If you're a guest, welcome. Um, I'd love to say hi to you before you leave. But um, this morning we are finishing up First Corinthians, so uh, we've gone through it fairly. Uh, expeditiously going back and forth between, you know, the midweek uh, kind of studies as we kept moving through. And then um, hopefully this last week you finished up 1 Corinthians 15. And then this morning I'm going to be finishing up the whole book in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. So um, so it's kind of exciting. I don't know. Like I, I, I like to go back and, and look at kind of where, where we walked through, right? Like, where, what, was, what did 1 Corinthians 1, like, what were we talking about? You know, and, and kind of keeping that thread through it, right? Because this is a letter that, that Paul wrote that's inspired by God that um, is the very words of God for our lives, right? And so as we walk through it, it's, it's kind of mixed, right? There's, we saw some sarcasm by Paul. <laughs> we saw some pretty harsh criticism by Paul, but we saw a lot of love and a lot of application of how we ought to interpret our lives, in the circumstances uh, of life, and how do we interpret that through that gospel lens, right? Um, well, chapter, six, uh, chapter 15 was pretty much like, like the climax of the, the chapter, right? Like, hopefully this week you read it, and it was like, man, this is like the resurrection, and this is what it's going to be like dwelling with Christ, and new bodies, and we all talked about, like, I don't know what age that's going to be, right? Like, but we're all going to have, like, new bodies, and everything's going to be great and amazing, and that, like, that was it. And then chapter 16 is like, farewell business. <laughs> it's like, it's really like, as I start reading it, I'm like, wow, well, how do I, how do I include this, right? Hey, tell, tell Bob I said hi, tell Dave this, tell, right? Like, I mean, that's kind of how the chapter ends. And so it's, it's, it, it kind of took me a little bit to go like, what, 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 what's the purpose of this, right? For, for Paul, he's, he's writing the closing remarks. So these are, in effect, his last words to a church he planted, right? He doesn't know when he's going to see him again, when he's going to talk to him again, if he's going to see or talk to him again. And so these are kind of his last words. So that kind of makes him important, right? Like if you had the last words of a loved one, you would probably cherish those things, right? You keep voicemails or whatever, right? Like, like that's important. And so in this respect, Paul is writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, his, his very last, the, the real apex of his letter. And so, but it's going to sound a lot like business. <laughs> it's going to sound a lot very functional, very logistical, very plain and ordinary. And so our task this morning is to look at Paul's emotion in it. Look at where why Paul is saying what he's saying, not, not just the substance of what he's saying, but what's causing him to say those words. And so that's what we're going to be diving into this morning. We'll, we'll be in um, the ESV. The verses will be on the screen, but obviously follow along. There's Bibles littered throughout, so you guys are, I, and I don't, we've never really said this, but like the blue ones are large print, just in case you want that, and then the white ones are like microscopic print. So I don't know that there's really a, a good in-between, but feel free, and you guys can take those home. So if you don't have a Bible, please feel free to take those things. We have, we have a ton of them. So, but first, let me start by praying. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for giving us your word, for speaking to us, for loving us enough to want us to know your heart. And that's our prayer this morning, Father, that you would um, just reveal your heart to us. Help us to understand who you are better. Help us to be comforted by your words. Help us to be encouraged and inspired. But let it all be for your glory, Father. We thank you for your son. And we pray all this in his name. Amen. All right. So here we go. Um, Paul's going to basically give a uh, talk about some sort of logistical thing. He's going to give a couple shout outs. He's going to give some encouragement, and then he's going to bounce, right? Like, that's, that's basically chapter 16 in a nutshell, okay? Um, but let's start in verse uh, 1. He says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, sorry, that's not verse 1. That's the end of chapter 15. <laughs> verse 1, now concerning the collection for the saints. 
as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. And then he's going to go on and explain this. All right, so we're just going to stop. So when he says now concerning, we've seen this throughout the letter, right? He says this over and over again. This is like his introductory, let me address the thing that you wrote me about. Remember, he's answering a letter that he had already gotten from the Corinthian church. So when he says now concerning, it's like, oh, okay, the sixth topic you gave me, right? We talked about tongues. We talked about prophecy. We talked about spiritual gifts. We talked about all these different things. He says now concerning this one. So this collection it's used two times in the Bible, and it's right here. So we don't have a lot of context. It's not used anywhere outside of the Bible. Um, and so we're going to spend a little bit of time on, on the substance of what he's saying, or the, the why of what he's saying, more than what the collection is. Um, so, but here, here's the important part, right? Look at what it says. It says, um, I directed the churches of Galatia, so also you're to do. This is a commandment from Paul. Would you guys agree? Like this is, this, there's no like, you can't sidestep this one. He's commanding the Corinthian church to, to do something. The something we're gonna get into, but he's commanding them to do something. And it, has, it pertains to this collection. So presumably Paul had written to them in that first letter that we don't have, that, that obviously wasn't inspired. Uh, he wrote to the Corinthian church and um, he maybe said something about a collection, and then they wrote back, what collection? <laughs> what do you want us to do? Can you clarify, right? And so now Paul is writing back going, okay, now concerning the collection, the thing that I told you guys about, let me uh, tell you more. But what's interesting is that Paul has authority. You guys get that, right? Like there's a unique authority. Remember, when we read through Acts, we see that Paul um, establishes elders in the churches, and then he leaves. And then like, there's, there's times when like, he goes back to, I think it's Ephesus, and he calls the elders of the churches in Ephesus to come and meet him. Like, th that's, the, that's the leadership body. That's what we have here. We have elders. But when Paul showed up, Paul's like, this is what you're doing. There's a difference, okay? We don't have a Paul. I mean, we do. It's in Scripture, right? And we don't need to get into that whole thing. But but this is why when we read the words that Paul is penning, they're scripture, they're authority, because they're the words of God. That's an important thing to capture, and we're going to see it's going to pop up a little bit later as well. All right, verse 2. On the, and so this is the command, this is concerning the collection. So now he's describing the collection. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. Okay, let me give you guys a little bit of context. And you can write this in your Bible as a reference, but Acts chapter 11 Verse 27 is where we get the historical account of what Paul is here describing. Acts chapter 11, verse 27. I thought you were going to jump me or something. I'm like, um, it's, it says, uh, now, now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. Does, that sounds very historical. And we can, we're, we're going to go through a whole Bible series in the next six weeks. So starting next week, and we're going to walk through it. These are some of these pieces that we go, this is history. This is intended to be history. Luke is writing Acts to document history, right? That sounded like a historical statement. In fact, it's, it's um, substantiated by uh, extra biblical witnesses. All right. Anyway, that's not what we're talking about, though. Verse 29, so the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea, and they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So there's a famine. There's a famine that's going on, right? It was prophesied. It actually happened in the days of Claudius, right? So here's all these things. You get a bunch of, I mean, tons of theology in this, right? So there's a prophet, prophesies that there's going to be a famine. The, el the uh, disciples, what do they do? They direct the churches. There's some authority. The disciples go, hey, we need to start laying aside some money for this collection. We're going to send it to the Jews or to the Christian Jews in Jerusalem. So what was happening was in Jerusalem, 
There was obviously some uh, conflict, standard conflict between the Romans and the Jews, but you now had Christians in the midst of all of that, kind of caught in the middle of all of this, right? They, they were Jews, but now they believe in Christ, and so they would still consider themselves Jews, just Jews that believe what the Old Testament prophecies were about Jesus, right? And so, so here they are, but then they're being neglected. They're being uh, disparaged. They're being, right? Like, like they're having an increasingly difficult time. And so what the disciples determine, we collectively, the churches that have no, who've never been to Jerusalem, right? These Gentile churches and these different places and all this, we're, we need to help them out. We need to support them. Like, that's, that's it. That's, that's what this is, okay? So this is not a discussion on tithing or offering or anything like that. This is a very finite discussion in context about these churches caring for each other, okay? So that's, that's, when we read this in context, that's what this is, okay? And so if you notice, what, do they, what does it say? And this is, again, just one of these little things. On the first day of the week, this is actually one of the first references to us recognizing that the Christian church started meeting on the first day of the week, as opposed to the Sabbath, which is the last day of the week. So just an interesting note. That's why we're here on Sunday instead of a Saturday. Um, and so what, and we'll, we'll get into a little bit more as to why that's connected, why Paul says on the first day of the week. All right, go over to 2 Corinthians. Paul's gonna write another letter to them, Right? 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and he's going to describe this collection and how these other churches had done this. And he kind of tells the Corinthians, like, hey, here's what the Macedonians did. Here's what these other churches are doing. And it's all about the same incident, this collection. He says, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and all earnestness and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace. Also, if you have your Bible, under, underline that with those words, act of grace at the end of verse 6 and then act of grace at the end of verse 7. You see, what, what Paul does in this, in this collection, whatever this collection is, he's, he's telling the Corinthians it, this is a heart condition. This isn't about how much, how often, you know, what, what's God pleased with? This is a very logistical, very functional thing. But Paul cares, and by implication, God cares about where their heart is in this. And so he points back to uh, the churches in Macedonia and says there is a corporate responsibility. This, the idea of a corporate responsibility, like a responsibility for like other organizations and Quite frankly, other people does not exist anymore in our culture. We care about ourselves. We, we, we are a very individualistic culture. And I say that personally as, as a confession. I, I think that that is a true statement in general. We live in a culture, honestly, a Western culture in particular is like this. An Eastern culture, very much more communal. But for us, very individualistic. And so what Paul is describing here is one church that doesn't know the saints in Jerusalem. It's like, hey, we want you guys to give your resources to these people that you don't know. Like, make an effort of it. Set it aside diligently doing this. If I were to start this program <laughs> for some church in Arizona, you guys would be like, eh, well, <laughs> don't we have our own stuff that we need to deal with? Didn't the Macedonian churches have their own financial burdens, didn't they have their own thing, right? It's an interesting picture, one that I don't think that we can really correlate very well. And he's going to get in and explain why this is the case. But, but when he says this act of grace, he says it over and over again. They were excited. I, the description at the beginning of verse 8 would seem to tee you up to say, I understand you guys don't need to give anything. You guys are the exception. 
But instead, what does it lead them to do? It leads them to extreme generosity. Their extreme poverty led to extreme generosity. Why? Because it's an act of grace. In fact, in uh, verse 4, it says, they were, the, the Macedonian churches were begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. That word favor is charis. It's grace. It's the same word. So they were begging to be able to act in grace. They, they, what they had been given freely by God, not just salvation, but life, breath, possessions, everything, they go, we want to act in grace. Why? Think about this. Think about if you're the saints in Jerusalem. Here, we're bringing this gift to you guys. Where did it come from? Or who, who gave it to you? You have no idea who they are. But they want you to have this. How do they respond? How do, the, how do the Christians in Jerusalem respond? God provided. God blessed us. This is grace. This is amazing. By whom did that come? By our hands, human hands, right? And so what he's saying here is like our opportunity is to give grace, to give, participate in acts of grace by our generosity, by loving others, by caring for others. We get to be executors of God's grace in the lives of others. You guys get that? Like grace is an amazing thing. That's, that's what inspires us. That's what motivates us. That's what the gospel is all about, that God's grace, and he gave us this undeserved merit. He loved us, not because of us, but in spite of us. And then we get to show that to other people. That's our job. It's our purpose. Not so that we can be touted as amazing, but so that God is transferring his grace through us into this world. Like, this is, this is why they were excited. I mean, let me, let me just read that again. In verse 8.2, 8, it says, For in severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty has overflowed in a wealth of generosity. Those are two, con right, very conflicting statements, humanly speaking but not when you look at it through the gospel lens. Paul's going to go on and explain why this is, uh, he's going to get a little bit into some, some theology here in Romans chapter 15. He's going to be referencing this same uh, event in verse 25. He says, At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints. This is an ongoing thing. This is the collection, okay? Okay. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it. Next sentence. And indeed, they owe it to them. Now, this is a little different now. Okay? For if the Gentiles, so he's meaning these churches that are giving their money, right? For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, the Jewish spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. And so Paul makes it really clear. In this context, we don't have an equivalent right now, right? But in this context, they go, you owe it to them. You owe it to them to give, to support them, to encourage them. Why? Well, because you're... You're a believer because of what they've done, right? Like, like, I'm here. Paul's writing this letter. He's like, I'm a Jew. I'm on the road being a missionary. I planted your church, right? Like, this is how, this, how God has chosen to execute this. And so there's this, there's this very interesting way that Paul translates this into a very functional thing. So let me just, so why does all this matter? We don't have a collection. I'm not starting a collection for some church somewhere. What's the heart condition? That, each one, that, that Paul is encouraging them. You guys, if, if there's an area in our lives that we need to really capture for Christ, it's our finances. This isn't, a, this isn't, this isn't ending in passing a plate, okay? okay? I, honestly, this is, this is a heart condition thing. Look at how he describes each one of these. Go back to 1 Corinthians um, 16, 2. He says, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper. What's the implication? The implication is that God has prospered you in some way with something, 
and, and you should set it aside and give it to somebody else. And oh, by the way, the beginning of the week, not your leftovers, right? At the beginning. He says, you're getting ready to start your week. And especially in an agrarian type of culture like this, in a trade culture, like, they're like, well, I don't know how many, I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know what business is going to look like this week. How could I possibly give my, get set aside at the beginning of the week? Can I wait till the end of the week? And then I'll set aside the money? He says, no. At the beginning of the week, there's faith in this. That's the heart condition. That's what Paul is, is pointing to here. He says, so at the beginning of the week, do this, and do it as you may prosper. God gives to us so that we can give to others. That's it. We are simply vessels, conduits for God's hand and feet here on earth. That's scripturally accurate. Just think for us. I mean, and, and most of us have experienced this when somebody has blessed us in a way that is incredible. It's like, Thank you to them, certainly, but thank you, God. When something amazing, when God answers something, whether, whether it's financial or emotional support or, or a text at the right time or whatever that is, God uses us to show his grace. You are the, gra you are the ones that provide the grace, you guys get that, right? Not the grace of salvation, like you can't do that, right? You can't go and say, I'm gonna change your heart. We don't have the ability to do that. That's God's exclusive work that he accomplished through Jesus Christ and sending his Holy Spirit. But the practical, the things of grace, the operations, the continuous undeserved merit and love that we can pour out on other people, even when they're jerks, that's grace. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Look at what verse 3 says. It says, they gave according to their means. Same things, as they prosper. According to their means. So I, that means there's not a standard. You guys get that, right? I would argue that means that there's not a percentage either, by the way. But that's a whole different discussion, okay? We're not going to get into that. Because that's not the context, okay? But what he's saying here is, according to their means, do you guys get that, like, and then back up to verse 2. Severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy, and their extreme poverty is overflowed in a wealth of generosity. How does extreme poverty translate into a wealth of generosity? Explain that to me, because my analytical mind doesn't have a solution for that. It doesn't make any sense. If I'm poor, what am I going to I don't know. I don't know what this looks like. I think it's Paul looking at their hearts, right? The, the widow that gives, right, that we read about in the Gospels, that gives uh, two coins or whatever, right? Like, that was, gener that was exceedingly generous on her part. Why? Because it was a lot of money? No, but because of her heart condition. She gave all that she had. So there's, there's a heart thing that Paul is looking at here as he's describing this. He's like, you guys understand, like, this is what God wants for us. So what's the summary? How do we apply this? Our lives are for each other, not ourselves. You guys agree with that? <laughs> so I don't most of the time. Right? I mean, this is tough. But, but this is what Paul is, is describing here. These people giving generously out of their poverty to people they don't know, setting aside before in faith before they even make their money that week. That's, that's on another level. It's on a grace level. And so this is how he explains this. Wealthy or not, comfortable or not, they gave. You know, and, and here's, here's the thing. Is this, this is where we, we all diverge into what does this mean for my pocketbook and what does this mean for my tithe or offering or whatever? How and when do I do that? And, you know, and that, it's not the context of this. And, in fact, we miss the point of this. You know, when Jesus talks about the heart, He's often talking about our idols and our idols being comfort and wealth and all these things. 
That's just the reality. And, and we need to recognize that, right? And we need to repent of it, and we need to see what we are clearly. Now, this doesn't mean that we need to go and sell all of our possessions, but it does maybe mean that our lives, right? God gives us breath, he gives us time, he gives us whole days and weeks, and he gives us employment, and he gives us resources and things. They're for others and not for ourselves. Can we do that? Can we, can we inventory our blessings and go, how am I using this for God's kingdom? I think we ought to. I'm a little afraid, if I'm honest, to do that. Because I'm sure I'm going to get to something and I'm going to go, eh, that one's for me, for sure. <laughs> but maybe, maybe it's just a way of thinking about it. Maybe, maybe, maybe I, I need to use it differently. Maybe God has given us these tools and we're just using them in the wrong way, right? I think I brought up an ax up here a while back talking about using a tool in the wrong way, right? I was since disproved, by the way. It was a bad metaphor, but um, but it doesn't matter. But like you got it, right? So God's giving us these tools. He's like, go, go show them acts of grace. Go point them to the cross. Go proclaim the gospel through your life and all the things that I'm giving you. And we go, thanks, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what that looks like for us. It does, does, that, does that mean that, um, you know, all vacations are off? No, it doesn't. <laughs> Is that just me my, and my selfishness talking? Maybe a little bit. I don't know. Honest, if I'm honest. But I also look at that and I go, no, I don't think so. Because what do you do? I, are, are you using your vacation, your time, to spend time getting closer to God and not being distracted by the world? Are you, are you investing in relationships? Because those are things that God wants us to do. How are you using your time? How are you using your resources, right? Can you buy something and go, this is an amazing thing. Whatever the thing is, I'm not going to list it because then I'm, you know, it's just not going to be good. But whatever the thing is, is it just for you? Or can you use it for God's kingdom? I'm not talking about just writing checks, right? You guys get this. So it's a heart thing. Whose kingdom are we building? And this is what Paul is addressing here. All right. Now he's going to break from that. So he, he talks about this collection. He's like, hey, this is what you guys need to be doing. And then he's going to kind of talk about this from a perspective um, of what seems to be very logistical plans. But again, we're going to read through this. We're going to try to understand this from Paul's perspective. We're going to read uh, verse 5 here. He says, I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. Seems super boring, doesn't it? But, but think about what Paul's doing. Paul's on his missionary journeys, right? He's going around, he's planting churches, he's doing all this stuff. And what does he say? He's like, I don't want to just pass through and say hi. I want to hang out with you guys. I want to invest some time in you guys. I want you to invest time with me. So he's saying invest in each other. Like, this isn't just investing in, in people and giving of our resources to pe faceless people that we have no idea, right? There's plenty of things that we can hop on Facebook, and I mean, we could, we could be broke in a minute if we just start giving to every single thing that pops up on our Facebook feed, right? He says, invest in each other. There's, there, this is Paul, who is planning churches and meeting, I mean, meeting a ton of people, right? Like, you got to imagine he's got a reputation, and people know him. And he's like, hey, I want to come and I want to hang out with you guys. And I want you to bless me on my journey. I don't think that's financial. I think that's emotional, spiritual. It's, it's probably, um, you know, refreshing to him. In fact, I think we'll see that here in a little bit. Partner with me. Partner with me as I'm on this journey. I want to come hang out. Are we investing in each other? You guys, like, and again, same theme, right? Like, this individualistic culture goes, man, I've got a lot of, I got a lot of friends on Facebook. 
I got a lot of people following. I got, I got some streaks on Snap, right? Like, like all of these things are things. But where's the deep, profound investment in relationships? Who are we pointing to the cross, reminding each other? Who's reminding us? Like, this is what Paul is doing. Paul's like, I wanna hang out with you. Why? Paul might just be like, man, he is just pouring to me for a little bit because I'm tired. Maybe he just wants to go have dinner with them. I mean, it's a very ordinary paragraph, isn't it? But you can read Paul's heart in this. It's like, I'm not, this isn't business. It's like, I'm not coming by just to check a box and move on. Make sure that the, my letters got delivered. Make sure you guys are reading them every once in a while, right? Like, it's not that. He wants to be refreshed. He wants to hang out with them. He wants to be with them. You know, I, there's a lot of strain on our emotions, right? I mean, this week, there was probably some news that was emotional, that there, you know, one way or another, pick your emotion. I mean, you, you could be emotional for a billion things on any given day. And frankly, we have, I would argue, more inputs that affect us emotionally than we can handle. But that's just my opinion. Are we, are we reserving any of those emotions for people that we actually know and see? Can we invest in their lives in a way that is substantial, that's emotional? Are we willing to risk that? Seems Paul was. Verse eight. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. So this is pretty cool because it shows us that, that Paul is uh, looking for opportunities, right? He says a wide door. That, that word is actually mega, which is kind of funny. Uh, it's a mega door. Um, a wide door for effective work. Paul goes, I'm moving around, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay in Ephesus at least until here because why? Because I see an opportunity an opportunity for God's work to be done. I see a wide door. I don't, we don't know what that was. We have no idea. Now, he does go on to say that he connects it. He says, and there are many adversaries. So I don't know. Maybe he's like, I got to stay there because things are going rough because that church is in battle and I need to be there and I need to do some hard work for God's glory. We ever think like that? <laughs> I mean, seriously. Right? Like, like, here's God rescuing us, saving us, giving us all these resources and gifts and loving us and securing us and adopting us and reconciling us to him and all these things. Are we, are we passionate? Are we looking for opportunities to start that conversation? to risk that relationship, to, to ask them what they need to be asked, to, to point them to the cross, to point them to their depravity and, and their, their lack of peace, to point to the one who can provide us with contentment and peace and joy. Are, like, are we willing to, to open our eyes and to be able to recognize when a wide door opens? Because I think, I think if you guys are like me, the answer is I, I'm, I'm too busy to look for the doors opening. I'm just going in the path that I had already planned. Paul seems to adjust his plans based upon prayer, a recognition of God's purpose in his life. He says, hey, I need to stop. I need to stay at Ephesus for a little bit. It's important. I really want to come to you guys, but not yet. That just, that just changes the mindset. Right? I don't, I don't know. I don't know what that would look like in my life. I don't, I don't, I don't know. To, to have the heart of God like actually impressing upon you to change your plans. <laughs> my calendar's pretty rigid. <laughs> you know? And to, to be 
to listen to the Holy Spirit in a way that says, man, this is, this is where I need to anchor. I wasn't planning on doing this, but I need to do this now. That seems to be how Paul responds to this. Okay, at the end of his letter here, he's going he's gonna to run through. Um, he, he's going to end up listing seven people in two households. So these are like his shout-outs. But again, there's some import to this. And so I'm going to kind of step through this as, as we walk through it. In verse 10, he says, When Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. So let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace that he may return to me, for I am expecting him with the brothers. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to visit you with the other brothers, but it was not at all his will to come now. He will come when he has the opportunity. And so Paul's writing to the Corinthian church, and he's saying, hey, these two guys are going to come by, and they're like, treat them well. Timothy was young, <laughs> so he, he, had a, he had a bit of an uphill battle when he was trying to preach and share the gospel. And so Paul is, right, and we just read all throughout 1 Corinthians that there's these super apostles, people coming in, so much so that they were knocking on Paul, saying like, yeah, you're not really that good. And now, here come, and now Timothy's on his way, and Paul's like, Treat them well, please. Treat them well. Treat each other well. I mean, that's what he's saying. Like, we can choose to treat each other however we want. The question is, is are we reflecting Christ as we do it? And so that's what he says. And he's like, put them at ease among you. Verse 13. He says, be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. It's chapter 13, right? He's cycling back. He's like, where does our strength come from? Love. We can do all things, right? It's, it's the love of Christ that compels us to live lives that are reflecting him, that are pointing to the cross. And so he's like, you can do everything. You can do anything. Be strong, be courageous, stand up. Paul's just finished going through all these things that were causing divisions in the church. How sad. Paul's like, don't you guys get it? Because you're missing it. You're, you're arguing about dumb things. Jesus died on the cross. God rescued you. He gave you eternity. And you're, and you're going nutso in your service and nobody understands what's going on. You're trying to edify each other or yourselves and not each other. Verse 15, he says, Now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. Be subject to such as these and to every fellow worker and laborer. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus, because they have made up for your absence, for they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such people. These people don't have titles, as far as we can tell, scripturally. They seem to just be people serving in the church. Like, they're just, they're just working. They're, they're laboring. That's it. Look what he says in verse 15, or sorry, 16. Be subject to such as these. That, that, that word is submit. It's the same word. Submit to these. Submit to these people. These people that are working and laboring. And what does he describe them as? And to every fellow worker and laborer. It wasn't like there are these two different groups of people. It's fellow. It's, it's all together. Right? You're a worker and laborer. They're a worker and laborer. Let's submit ourselves to each other. Submit ourselves to each other, serve each other, refresh each other, allow our spirits to be refreshed by each other. You see, like, these are the closing remarks of Paul. He's like, all this other stuff doesn't matter. Point each other to Christ, encourage each other, edify each other. Verse 19, the churches of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Prisca. That's the same uh, as Priscilla. 
together with the church in their house, sends you hearty greetings in the Lord. You know, we don't, again, I, we read through these things, and we can read through them fairly quickly, but these, these churches are like sending greetings to these other churches, right? Like, maybe I've failed, but I've never sent a greeting from the Crossing Church. Like, I don't know, you guys all want to say hi to somebody? or You know what I mean? Like, like it seems weird, but it's very personal. It seems very personal. In fact, that word is actually salute. The churches of Asia salute you, like, and then, and then the Priscilla and Aquila, like, really salute you. Um, it, that's actually what it says. Um, so there's like, there's like a profoundness to this. There's, there's some sort of relationship here that's more than just, oh, they're brothers and sisters in Christ, or, oh, yeah, they're, they're Christians too. There's something more substantial going on, as if God has one church, as if our unity is intended to proclaim Christ in a way that the world can't comprehend. As if our love for people that we don't know, our generosity to people that we don't know, is intended to glorify God in a way that nothing else can. It says, all the brothers send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. It's not a command. I mean, it might be... <laughs> contextually in the culture that was appropriate okay <laughs> i paul write these greetings with my own hand that's actually pretty cool right at the very end like this end right so if you were to look at the autograph the original uh letter it would have changed the font would have changed right the 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 script would have changed and then I think there's another, I should have researched this before, but I think in another letter, Paul says, see what big letters I write with. Like, he, it probably looks like a kid's writing, right? He's got somebody, like, that's actually, it's called, like, an amunesis. Somebody know that? Anyway, it's somebody that writes for somebody else uh, that were professionals. And so he probably looked great, nice script, right? Cursive. Everybody knows how to write cursive, right? Um, uh, I can't even write in lowercase, so... Um, you know, so it's like all nice writing, and then at the end, Paul grabs the pencil and's like, all right, <laughs> I'm, right? Why? Why would Paul do that? Yeah, because he loves them. It's personal. This isn't just business. It's not a typed letter, right? Not that it could have been. It's personal. And then look at what he says. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Our Lord, come. Maranatha. That's what that is. It's like a, a proclamation like, I want you to come, God. Jesus, I want you to return. And we've talked about this throughout. Like, this needs to always be on our hearts. This needs to be the motivation as we're, as we're ending this letter. All these things, we can get so bogged down in all the details of things, but we're waiting for Jesus to come back. And we're looking forward to the day when Christ is revealed. And all the meaning and purpose and the faith that we've had is going to become reality. And we're going to see God for who he is. Can you guys just dwell on that for a second and what that day is going to be like? The joy? It's going to be incredible. And Paul goes, don't forget, Jesus is coming back. Your, your little issues, not a big deal. Your poverty, not a big deal. Your wealth, not a big deal. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let me pray.